Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, party people, to Office Hours, the webcast where you post questions over at PollGab, upvote the questions that you'd like to see me cover, and then I go through those, answering those, and or sometimes dodging the question. Now, let's go see what y'all posted in here. So Peter asks, do many of your clients disable the SA account for security? No. Now, what are your thoughts on this practice? So I don't do security work at all, but from what I've seen with people disabling the SA account, it's caused more problems than it's prevented. Uh, there were even there have even been cumulative updates and service packs in the past where if the SA account wasn't present, the CU or service pack would leave the server in an unusable state, and you'd have to call Microsoft for support. I don't have a problem with people doing it as long as that they're aware of issues like that. The more that you deviate from a normal SQL Server configuration, the more likely it is that something will go wrong. Uh, and and, and to, to the reason why I don't really consider that a big thing on the radar is a lot of times in the, the apps that I work with, people use the exact same username and password for the application for years, like it's hard-coded all over the place, uh, and everybody in the organization knows it, and that application is a sysadmin on the server, so usually I have bigger fish to fry. Uh, next up, I was never given a name, says, what are your thoughts on using AI to generate SQL queries for ad hoc reporting or for production? I think it's idiotic. I think most users can't explain the data that they want in plain English with any accuracy. There, there are a lot of things where you need the rigidity of SQL, and you have to go back and ask so many clarifying questions. And if you just let users type in plain English, they'll get a result back and not understand that the SQL that the app generated doesn't really match the data that they're looking for. 20-some years ago, there was something called English Query that shipped in SQL Server 2000. And I remember playing around with it briefly. And a manager said, OK, show me net profit by salesperson. And I'm like, that doesn't even work. That doesn't even make sense because profit is calculated at the overall organization level. There are things that are uh, that are done after the sales happen. But English Query was able to generate a query with data, and the user went, "Great, this is exactly what I was looking for." And I'm like, "That that data isn't even correct." So I get really nervous about translating pure English into T SQL. Chandwich says, what are your go-to note-taking app? Typora. Typora is a markdown editor that uh, it's uh, across both Windows and Macs. Um, uh, is that all you use to improve note-taking? I've also tried to use Apple's Notes, and I it's been hit or miss for me. It's, like use, it's nice because I have my notes available across all my platforms, but I, I just have never really dived that much into it. Typora with markdown files is still the big one for me. Uh, Olafur asks, what are some good ways to identify all non-clustered indexes that could exceed the max key length? Write a DMV query, so there are, call, or there are uh, system tables or system views like information schema tables, information schema columns, where you could go write that kind of thing. It uh, just hasn't been something that really hits my radar that much, um, because frankly, Rather than going about it from a database perspective, I usually find out from an application perspective. Like somebody says, hey, we had an insert fail. Why? And if they aren't having inserts fail, then I, I don't really care about that indexing problem. Next up, we have Namor says, should SQL affinity masks be used or configured when reporting services and our SQL server are running on the same server so that each process gets its own processor? No, I'm not a big fan of that at all. For Reporting services is not CPU intensive. It shouldn't need dedicated full-blown CPU cores. And if you hit the point where it is, where it's using so much CPU power that you're trying to get it dedicated cores, that's what separate VMs are or four, that you build a separate VM with standard edition, usually standard is all you need for reporting services, uh, and then that way you can ensure uh, that you don't have to deal with CPUs stepping on each other, plus gives you the ability to build in some high availability for reporting services, like you can put it behind a load balancer and then patch them at different times. Next up, 
We have Soon says, what features are no longer inv worth investing time and learning from an admin or developer perspective? Um, I don't have an answer to that. Because I think it, instead of learning tools, what I usually tell people when you're trying to figure out what to learn is, go through the list of tasks that you need to accomplish. What is it that you need to do in your day-to-day -day work, doing database administration, doing developer, whatever? And then what are the tools that help you accomplish that task? Learn the tools you need to accomplish the tasks that you need. I just personally don't recommend going and randomly learning tools that you don't have a task to do to go to get better. That's just my approach. Uh, next up, we have Gustav asks, if you had to give a Razzie award for the worst performing cloud storage for VM SQL, which cloud vendor would win the award? For, for me, when I'm a, a, a database administrator at a company, I don't get to choose which cloud vendor we use. Which cloud vendor we use was a decision that was made by a bunch of executives at a golf course somewhere when they had time on their hands and they were uh, getting wined and dined by a bunch of different vendors and they said, so-and-so is a strategic partner. Um, so for me, I, I don't want to really like bash one cloud vendor over another. Um, I will say that they all have really crappy storage options, and they all have decent storage options. And most of the time, it's that the, the sysadmins and DBAs didn't take the time to learn which ones were good and which ones were bad. They just took the defaults and deployed it, and it just doesn't work in this day and age. Uh, next up, Stockburn says, Hi, Brent. I assume you've needed to use a plan guide at some point in your career. I have. Uh, but at what point in a performance investigation do you decide that this is the way to solve a problem? For me, it's only emergency duct tape. Because as soon as the query starts changing, the plan guide is no good anymore. When people add a column to a query, when people add a join... So what I would rather do is get a better long-term solution because my personal belief as a performance tuner, and I have the same thing as a DBA, as a developer, when I touch something, I don't want to have to touch it again for three years. Three years is my magic number. If I put in a performance fix for something, I don't want to have to touch it again for three years. And that sounds like a really long time, right? Sounds like, oh my God, what could possibly last for three years? Query and index changes are usually a better off goal. If you try to solve performance problems with just plan guides, your time bomb is way shorter than that. Because that query, somebody's going to add a column, somebody's going to add a join within the next three years, your plan guide instantly vaporizes. I mean, it doesn't disappear, it's just for an unrelated query. And now you're going to have to go back in much sooner. If you use short-term techniques like plan guides to solve everyday problems, what you're building up is massive technical debt. <gasps> this will last for six months. This will last for six months. This will last for six months. Guess what happens to your job in six months? All that is coming due and pretty soon, you have a full-time job fixing the fixes you put in six months ago. It's not sustainable. You want to shoot for something that's much longer of a fix than that. Uh, Soon says, what are your top three favorite movies? This feels like a fishing question. This feels like the kinds of questions that you would ask uh, when you're trying to get past my password authentication hint somewhere. So I'm going to skip that question. I hope that that's fair. Uh, Laze says, we have a server with high CPU load, eight cores. Eight cores. <whistles> wow. This has 12 or 16, I forget. I think my phone has 8. High CPU on a phone. Wow, that must be problematic. And high weight stats for parallelism and CPU yield. Max stop 8, CTFP 50. I'm starting to think that this person is just yelling out random things. I have a red car with blue vinyl seats and a dashboard and strange floor mats. How do I get to Iowa? 
I'm thinking about decreasing max stop to four, maybe even two, to leave more cores to run free to run other queries. Oh, you want the queries to take longer. How do you think that's going to go down? The princess is in another castle. The solution that you're looking for is not here. That's not what you should be going for. And then we'll take uh, one more. We'll see here. This is Yitzhak asks, how do you determine the optimal auto growth size for a given data file? What's the longest your users will wait during a transaction? Now, for me, you know, I don't have to worry about that at all for data files, because with instant file initialization, it can jump of any given data size instantly. So I'm, a fine, I'm fine with, on normal databases, like 4 gigs in terms of a size. Just whenever you need to jump, just go ahead and jump it out by a lot so that I don't have to worry about it again for a while. If you have a whole bunch of really tiny databases, if you're the SaaS uh, provider type option where it's software as a service and every client is in its own database, that's differently. But for most modern normal databases, 4 gigabytes for me is a completely fine auto growth size. I could imagine if you're like, 4 gigs, that's big data, that you go down to 1 gig. But for me, 4 gigs is usually the smallest I would go. All right, so that's it. My coffee shop is now open. That makes it sound like I own the coffee shop. But the coffee shop that I like to go to in the mornings uh, is now open. So I'm going to go swing down there and get something that they call a ham pillow. They have creative names for stuff. Ham pillow. I wonder if you can guess what that is. Ham pillow. Maybe I'll answer it down in the comments. Uh, but it sounds so much more attractive than the uh, regular name for this item. So I'm like, oh, that's just, why would I not want a ham pillow? That sounds delightful. So I'm going to go get myself a ham pillow and a dark mocha, and I will see y'all on the next Office Hours. Adios.